David, are we ready? Yes, the YouTube live stream is now playing. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Larry Klein. I'm mayor for the city of Sunnyvale. And this is our third listening session as part of our Sunnyvale Unity Initiative. Sunnyvale Unity represents the city's commitment to building a culture of belonging where all members of our diverse community feel included, heard, and respected. The first step we are taking is to actively listen to our community's concern, to you. And we are being deliberate in ensuring that we listen to all members of our community, particularly those community members that often feel marginalized. We want to better understand your concerns, your perspectives on a path forward for Sunnyvale. To stay engaged, visit sunnyvale.ca.gov unity to subscribe to our email list. Tonight, we are here to listen to our LGBTQ plus community. Last year, we partnered with the Santa Clara County of LGBTQ Affairs on an LGBTQ listening session. We're lucky to once again have their partnership for tonight's session. Thank you for being here. I also wanna thank Fabulous Sunnyvale, our local LGBTQ meetup group, and Silicon Valley Pride for their sponsorship for tonight's event. Lastly, I wanna acknowledge my council colleagues who are joining today, Vice Mayor Nancy Smith, Council members Gustav Larson, Russ Melton, Michael Goldman, and Mason Fong are here to listen to you. Council member Glenn Hendricks cannot join us because of a conflicting meeting. And city manager Kent Steffens and our chief of public safety, Fon No, are also here. I want to express my sincere gratitude to those of you who've chosen to, to participate in this important conversation. Your support and your engagement are vital. Together, we can make our city a safe, welcoming, and vibrant place for everyone. With that, I'll turn it over to Sarah Fernando from the Office of LGBTQ Affairs, who will be monitoring our panel discussion tonight. Sarah? Thank you, Mayor, and thank you all for joining us this evening for the Sunnyvale Unity Listening Series. My name is Sarah. I'm from the Office of LGBTQ Affairs, and I go by she, her pronouns. I'm the Senior Management Analyst for the LGBTQ uh, Affairs Group, so thank you so much for having us this evening. Uh, Sunnyvale stands united with community members calling for an end uh, to systemic racism and anti-LGBTQ discrimination. Your support and Engagement are vital as we find a path forward. And we thank you for joining tonight's LGBTQ plus panel and dialogue. Tonight's event is in sponsorship with the Office of LGBTQ Affairs, Silicon Valley Pride, and happy Pride for folks that you don't know, this week is actually Pride Week. And I'm super excited that this is gonna be our kickoff to Silicon Valley Pride Week. And everyone is welcome to join on the virtual celebration happening this Saturday and Sunday. As well as thank you to fabulous Sunnyville for uh, being in partnership with tonight's event. Uh, building on last year's LGBTQ community listening forum in Sunnyvale, this event will be a dialogue on equity and inclusion, uh, intersectionality and police practices. And we have a little bit of a short video to show just exactly what was talked about in last year's uh, listening forum. So go ahead and play that video.
very cool to see that. And thank you, Daniel, also from the Office of LGBTQ Affairs for creating that video. I know you're in the audience, uh, so thank you very much for creating that. And it's really enlightening to see some of the things that stemmed from that conversation. So this is gonna be a great continuation of that conversation. But without further ado, let's bring up today's panelists for today's listening session. First up, I would like to introduce the founder of Fabulous Sunnyvale, Mr. Richard Mellinger. How are you, Richard? I am doing very well tonight, Sarah. Uh, thank you so much to the city of Sunnyvale for hosting this event, to Sarah for moderating, to all our other panelists. Uh, my name is Richard Mellinger. I wear a lot of different hats. I helped found Fabulous Sunnyvale with uh, Jeremy Gluckman Picard. Um, I am also chair of the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission for the city of Sunnyvale. And I am chair of Livable Sunnyvale, which is our local pro housing, transit, and sustainability organization. Awesome. Thank Great you, Richard. To be here tonight. Yeah. And, and by the way, my pronouns are he, him, and I identify as a bisexual man. Thank you for sharing that, Richard. All right, folks, up next, we have queer social worker, daughter of gay fathers and lifetime resident of Sunnyvale, Dr. Heliana Ramirez. Welcome, Heliana. Good afternoon, Sarah. It's so nice to be here. Thank you very much to the city of Sunnyvale for inviting me here. Um, my name is Eliana Ramirez. I um, was born and raised in Sunnyvale by gay fathers and a heterosexual mother. And as Sarah mentioned, I do identify as queer. And I'm a social worker who has served LGBTQ plus populations for the better part of the last 20 years. So it's really an honor to be here with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure for uh, you joining us today. Up next, we have from Fremont High School, GSA, and that stands for Genders and Sexualities Alliance president. Just started school this week. Welcome to the stage, Mel Parlan. Hi, Mel. Hi, thank you so much for having me this evening. Again, yeah, I'm the president of my high school is GSA. I'm also a senior this year. And personally, I do a lot of interdistrict work. So that means working with other high schools GSA and working on how can we um, make campus a more inclusive environment for queer students and allies. Awesome. Yeah, so exciting that you're joining us today. And finally, rounding out our panel today is adult services librarian for the Sunnyvale Public Library. Everyone give it up for Aiden Kwan. Welcome Aiden. Thanks, Sarah. My name is Aiden Kwan. I am a non-binary person and use any pronouns. I do most of the library's LGBTQ programming for adults, including co-organizing last year's listening session with the county. Um, I've been with the city for about a year and a half, before which I worked creating queer spaces and resources in Seattle. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We can't wait to hear expertise on a lot of the things that we have uh, for this panel today. So uh, you folks saw the video and that was a really, really cool video in terms of seeing all the all the notes that we're taking. The year has passed, almost a year, right? Because that happened early September. So um, looking and reflecting on the 2019 LGBTQ listening forum, has there been any kind of positive momentum in Sunnyvale showing active and visible support for the LGBTQ community? Who wants to get us started? Well, I'm happy to get us started. Um, it was really an honor to be part of the listening session last year. And I just want to say thank you again to the city of Sunnyvale and to LGBTQ affairs for Santa Clara County. Um, I think that the not only was that such an important discussion that we had across generations last year, but the fact that you're now having this conversation today um, really speaks to how serious the city is about um, making this an inclusive place for everyone. And um, I would say that inviting not only community members to be here, but city council members, but the chief of police, that there are really key players across the entire community who have been invited here suggests that there is a very strategic way in which the city is addressing these topics. So thank you. 
Yeah, I'll have to plus one to that. I actually partook in this year's Sunnyvale rainbow flag raising ceremony. And although it was small, it was just so heartwarming to see the city of Sunnyvale raise the uh, rainbow flag um, along with like, I, I think the, the folks from the fire department were there, which I saw was uh, was really exciting. And then I saw Larry and the, the uh, Mayor Klein in the convertible, which I thought was really, really cool. <laughs> Um, so really heartwarming to see those comments. Uh, how about other folks? Has there any has there been any kind of positive momentum? Go ahead, Aiden. Yeah, so I don't know about um, visible changes, but within the city as an employer, because the, the library is part of the city, there have been um, some changes in that just recently, we have a certain way that we're supposed to format our signatures. And just recently that was expanded to include the option for people to include their pronouns. Um, and for me, I find that really significant because I work inviting LGBTQ speakers to the library. And it's always something that I've had to add in manually, um, which, because if you don't include it, then it's, it's a little bit um, embarrassing when you're, when you're working with um, LGBTQ presenters, because you know it's kind of a standard etiquette. Um, so that was a really positive change. Um, and in the library, we did have a staff training in, I think it was October, that I think helped things click for a lot of the staff who were already, um, already considered themselves allies and, you know, were well-meaning, but didn't necessarily understand all of the issues um, around um, LGBTQ identities. And after we had that training, we did make some internal changes, such as um, advising staff to use gender neutral language when not knowing what a person uh, prefers and removing the, um, the gender field from our patron database because we just weren't using that information and there was no reason to ask people to disclose it. I'll chime in a little bit, um, which is uh, one big thing that happened was I believe that the flag ordinance got passed and the study issue got completed, which means it is now much easier if city council wants to display a particular flag for them to do so. Um, and the reason that took a while is there are some legal, you need to have a clear process for how to display a flag so that you can't just, anyone who wants you can't just come and make you display their flag. Um, but so that's, that's a big deal. Um, obviously the coronavirus has rather scotched, uh, a lot of progress this year. Uh, unfortunately that's been, uh, it's not something you can really plan for exactly. Um, but I, I wanted to echo just how great the flag ceremony and the car parade was for the for pride this this year i thought that was a fantastic gesture it's the second year running that we've had the queer the the lgbt flag raised and i'm looking forward to seeing more sorts of events along those lines in the coming years that's so awesome to hear and just to hear that there's an actual process for getting flags raised i think that's amazing just because like the flag I have right over here, right? The trans flag for me, just seeing that in any kind of space, just is such an, a welcoming symbol of, of inclusion and, and like equity. It's, it's, it's great to hear the progress that's been made. So that's great. Um, aside from you know, Fabulous Sunnyvale, and obviously, Richard, yeah, you, you created Fabulous Sunnyvale. Um, but other than Fabulous Sunnyvale and those community groups, where do LGBTQ folks go to find community in Sunnyvale, be it advocacy, be it social justice work, or even just social well being? Um, and if there are those places or those spots, um, what resources would you recommend? And I think Mel, I remember we had a conversation about this. So I'm gonna start off with Mel. Yeah, I have quite a few resources I'd like yeah. to share. If you live near a high school or you know of younger people who still attend high school, probably their, um, their school does have a GSA. I know that if you are attending 
any school within the Fremont Union High School District, your school definitely does have a GSA. So don't be afraid to contact any of your teachers or your guidance counselor or student advocate because to an extent, they do a really good job at keeping information confidential for you. In addition, there's also the LGBTQ youth space in downtown San Jose. They provide fun activities and counseling for individuals ages 13 to 25. There's also the Billy DeFrank Community Center. They provide HIV testing, which is amazing. I'm not sure if due to the current times they still do that, but if they do, it is a first come first serve basis. Obviously, there's also the Office of LGBTQ Affairs, which is the government office, and they can provide you with referrals to other resources throughout Sunnyvale. In regards to online resources, there is the Trevor Space um, Forum. It is a monitored site for individuals ages 13 to 24, and they monitor just for safety reasons. There's also the um, PFLAG organization, and they run a series of chapters throughout the nation and our chapter being, or the closest chapter to us being the San Jose chapter. And so they provide a lot of resources for families and are really, they really like to promote themselves as a company that was led and brought up by the community. So a grassroots movement. And for those uh, queer folk of faith, there is the Stone Church of Willow Glen in San Jose. Yeah. I'm going to need that list, Mel. And <laughs> that, that's a wonderful, exhaustive list. Go ahead, Richard. I've got a couple more to add on there. Um, so along for people of faith, there's also the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship um, in Sunnyvale, which is very queer inclusive. Um, there is, so for social justice work, Livable Sunnyvale is not directly focused on LGBT issues, but the sort of issues of housing justice, et cetera, had definitely align with a lot of the needs of the community. Um, I can, and I can say that it is a very queer welcoming space. Um, beyond that, um, there are, let's see. Um, I can't think of any like dedicated spaces and businesses off the top of my head within the city of Sunnyvale. Um, and I'm not sure I'm supposed to mention this, but there is the Stonewall Democratic Club in San Jose. Uh, I'm sure there are a number of other organizations as well of political involvement, if that's sort of what interests you. Um, so but yeah, that's, there's a lot of resources out there available. Absolutely, and I'm, okay, go ahead, Heliana. Thank you. Um, Veterans Affairs Palo Alto Healthcare System, which has several campuses in the area. Um, the Veterans Affairs Palo Alto Menlo Park campus has an LGBT veteran support group. Um, there's also El Camino Hospital in Mountain View, Kaiser Hospital in Santa Clara, and VA Palo Alto have all been recognized by the healthcare, uh, the, by the Human Rights Campaign as being leaders in healthcare equality index. So those are all healthcare centers that have staff who are interested in supporting LGBTQ identified patients as well as employing LGBTQ people. Um, there's also in San Francisco, the LGBT community center. Oakland has a new pride center that has recently opened up. And there's also the um, Pacific Center, which is in Berkeley on Telegraph Avenue. And there's one more that I neglected to mention which is Silicon Valley Pride, oh. which does a number. <laughs> uh, that Hi, was Sarah. A, <laughs> I wasn't going to admit that. Oh, uh, you, you threw me for a curveball because I was going to say, I've heard from the conversations we had that the Sunnyvale Public Library is actually a pretty strong resource. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to throw it over to Aiden, who's this way towards me, or maybe it's that way, that way. Um, can you tell us a little about some of the programming other than the listening forums that have already taken place? What are some of the resources that the library has? Yeah, um, so right now we haven't had a whole lot of LGBTQ specific programs online um, since we've moved all of our uh, programming online just because there are so many organizations that specialize in that. And without the distance thing, I think they're sort of accessible to um, everybody. But before we moved everything online, um, we 
marched in last year Silicon Valley Pride Parade and leading up to it, we had a, a series of, of programs such as um, creating uh, like uh, signs to, to carry during the parade. Um, we had an LGBTQ film series um, and we've had, we had one uh, drag queen story time in the building and then we did do a virtual drag queen story time. Um, and so we, we've, had, we've had a few here and there, I'm sure I'm, I'm forgetting some, um, but it's definitely been sort of uh, a pet project of mine to bring in more LGBTQ programming. That's so awesome to hear. Love the library. Oof. Um, and I love Silicon <laughs> Valley Pride too, don't get me wrong. <laughs> So uh, thank you for sharing that, Aiden. Um, so based on everyone's lived experience here and the communities that you're connected with, uh, what intersectional issues does Sunnyvale need attention right now? Is there anything in terms of intersectionality that you might find some gaps here and there? And I know, Heliana, the, there, there was a discussion on intersectionality. I wanted to get uh, your thoughts on intersectionality and um, living in Sunnyvale. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and I'll totally answer that. And one thing I wanted to mention was I forgot to say Carla's Boutique is down in San Jose and is another place for people um, who identify as being part of the transgender community and gender diverse community. Um, and uh, in terms of intersectionality, I think there are several places. One is thinking about the experiences of Latinx and Latine, LGBTQ people, um, with the um, major policy changes that have happened in the United States, be it for people who are crossing the border um, as migrants or people who are dreamers in schools um, who do not have citizenship people who are LGBTQ and part of those communities, if there are issues around safety um, that they would otherwise call 911 for, they might be concerned right now to call 911, scared that they would be swept up by immigration services. Um, I think also we have this amazing senior center in the city of Sunnyvale um, for our LGBTQ seniors. Um, there are particular challenges and needs um, that would enable them to age in place in their homes and or to access senior services. Um, so those are just two examples of places where we might wanna think about intersectionality. The third would be, and this would go across all populations within the LGBTQ community, issues around interpersonal violence and domestic violence. Um, if there are times when there's violence in our homes, we might be um, hesitant to call 911 for fear that when first responders would arrive at our house, they might assume that it's not domestic violence, that it's just um, kind of a fight that happens between same gender people. But in fact, it has all of the uh, dynamics that are difficult of when it's in a family or when it's in a romantic relationship. Yes, thank you for sharing that. I know Aiden, you also brought up intersectionality in some of our conversations that we had. Did you wanna share a little bit about intersectionality? Yeah, um, the main thing that I wanna mention is that one thing that makes Sunnyvale demographically different from a lot of American cities um, and, especially, and even other cities in our area is we have a very high immigrant population and the specific cultural makeup of that population um, differs from our closest um, LGBTQ hubs in Oakland and San Jose and San Francisco. And so a lot of the resources that are available to LGBTQ people um, are ill-equipped to deal with how LGBTQ issues intersect with um, cultural expectations and language barriers within a family. So for example, coming out to one's parents um, in a family where the children and the parents have different first languages and come from different cultural backgrounds can become less a question of, I don't know whether my parents believe being transgender is a legitimate thing and more, I don't know if my parents have ever heard the word transgender or what terms they might be familiar with and what is the cultural context that informs those terms. Mm. Um, so as difficult as it is for LGBTQ people generally to find community in Sunnyvale, I can say from personal experience that it's even more difficult finding um, support that addresses LGBTQ immigrant needs. Yeah, and I greatly appreciate you bringing that up. Even in my own community here within, and I don't live in Sunnyvale, but I've gone to Sunnyvale for several events. And I live in Campbell, but I most of my time is occupied in San Jose for the events that I go to. And even the events I go to aren't as intersectional as I would love it to be, not in comparison. And what I love about 
this South Bay community is that when we actually show up, and this is me, you know, being part of Silicon Valley Pride, we show up in diversity, and that's what I absolutely love. But there are some pockets where you have those, uh, like, community celebrations where it's not as intersectional as it should be. Sometimes it's a majority of some, you know, orientation that's there, or uh, other times it's just, you know, a very kind of like, uh, not as diverse of uh, a scene as you would want it to be. So me going to some of those scenes, it's, yeah, it's it's great to be in the presence of LGBTQ folks, but to be the only trans person in the space or even the only woman in the space, or even a lot of times the only Filipino in the space, because I identify as a queer uh, trans Filipino woman, all those intersecting identities is just like, uh, for me, I just feel that to accept me in the space is to accept all of me. But in terms of just me being like, just, just visually welcome, when I get in there, I have to be a little bit more out there and Gregorious and and put my 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 personality out there just a little bit more, just to have fun. <laughs> in other words, and I know like for 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 the trans community, and this is something we're we're taking a careful look at at the Office of LGBTQ Affairs, seeing what resource we have here locally in the South Bay that could serve just the trans community. And I'm talking about just not not all LGBTQ. We have a lot of those spaces, but that I have not seen or heard of a trans-specific community-based organization um, here locally. And this is the challenge that I put on a lot of, you know, community-based organizations and even my own office. Um, I know Richard also talked about intersectionality. Richard, did you have anything to add in terms of intersectionality? A little bit, yeah. And my take on it is like, since I do a lot of work in the housing space, it's the housing crisis falls disproportionately on LGBTQ individuals, many of whom cannot draw on the sorts of family wealth and resources and connections that their straight counterparts can, um, many of whom uh, have frankly are here because they weren't welcome in their hometown. They came to Cal, you know, what was Harvey Milk's line, right, you know, the boy from Altoona can come to San Francisco, but well, he can't really anymore, right? Um, you know, that is an intersectional issue. The cost of living in the Bay Area uh, and the difficulty of finding decent, affordable housing, housing where you're not, for instance, at the mercy of a bad landlord. Um, I have a friend who was basically uh, harassed out of his home after he put up a pride flag because his daughter was by, right? Uh, and this was in Cupertino. This is not, you know, off in Alabama or somewhere. This was right here, okay? Um, so that's, that's a major challenge. And like also uh, transit. Again, you know, when uh, working class folks. And, you know, there is kind of the stereotype of, oh, the rich white gays. Okay. But you look at what the actual economics, most LGBTQ folks, you know, they're actually like suffering economic consequences from discrimination, from, you know, on average, it's, there's less wealth in the LGBTQ community. Um, so, okay, if your community is one where you need to own a car to get around, right, that's a problem. That's an equity concern that directly affects the LGBTQ community. Um, so these sorts of issues, you know, housing and transportation, they absolutely, and Liana's point, you know, healthcare, right, making sure that we have affordable, affirming healthcare available. So... Yeah, that's that's sort of how I see it. Yeah, go ahead, Aiden. Yeah, and I think it's um, I think those are really really good points, Richard. And I think it's also worth um, saying clearly that these are issues that intersect with race and class. So we can't really look at solving these issues of of housing and transit as um, how are we helping the LGBTQ community? How are we helping the Black community? We also have to look at how these things intersect and and keep in mind that, you know, these communities are not discrete. There are people who mm -hmm. are 
in both of them and who are affected more because of that. Mm -hmm. Right. And I know, Mel, you had your hand up. Yeah. So as someone who interacts with a whole bunch of other students, I can for sure say that I'm constantly looking for ways to improve myself and my teachings and whatever I'm trying to portray to the rest of my club, because within every year, it seems like the underclassmen are being so much more open and they're they belong to so many minority groups and whatnot that I for sure can't can ever experience, can ever know. And so again, that ties into what Aiden said with um, the whole, just like race being a part of it. And so with that, I think confidentiality is like a, a big thing, especially in regards to how I mod, like how I um, function my club. I double check to see if it's okay for me to send them emails for me to have their contacts because I don't know who's whose student or whose parent is monitoring monitoring their student. Yeah, that's great to know. And in the realm of uh, intersectionality, um, I'm going to pivot just a little bit. And what I find um, really cool about Sunnyvale Unity is um, you folks actually had a, a conversation around the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, the Black Lives Matter movement has brought national attention to the role of law enforcement. Uh, does the presence of Sunnyvale law enforcement make you or the LGBTQ communities that you serve feel safe? Why or why not? And Hiliana, I think we had a, like I remember our conversation around the Black Lives Matter movement and safety. Did you want to get us started? Sure. Um, well, I guess I would just start off by acknowledging my privileges. So as a light-complected Chicana and as um, somebody who uses she, her pronouns and who is read as female by others in society, I tend to walk down the street or if I wait at a bus station, I'm not concerned that somebody might potentially attack me verbally or physically because I don't fit their idea of what I'm supposed to look like or how I'm supposed to act. If, however, I was uh, at risk of being assaulted verbally or physically anywhere that I walk in society, um, I might be very concerned about using public transportation. And if I were to call for assistance, whether or not I would be treated um, fairly and as um, a, a full person. I know that um, there are plenty of stories of people who identify as transgender and who are gender diverse, who have had experiences like a heart attack on the street and somebody calls 911 and the paramedics show up. And when they open up the shirt to begin to give CPR, if the person's body does not match what the emergency responders expect to see, people have been left to die sometimes in those emergency situations. Um, so I just want to start off by saying that, you know, my privilege means that I have a very different experience than other people. Because there's such high rates of rejection in LGBTQ communities by our parents and thinking about young people, there are a large number of young people who are LGBTQ who are homeless on the street. And I wonder also about the experiences of LGBTQ homeless youth, um, the extent to which they feel safe. Um, being in society. And um, so those would be some questions that I would have. Um, and then also, especially as I mentioned before, our Latinx, Latina people who may or may not have citizenship. If they live in a home where there are people, some people have citizenship and other people don't. Again, if 911 is called, what are their experiences? Or do they fear even calling 911 for help? Yeah, thank you for sharing. And one thing I have to say about the Black Lives Matter movement is, um, and I've been to several of the Black Lives Matter movements uh, here locally um, within San Jose. And what I love about it is that there, there's a sense of safety, I feel, when I'm with those folks. And I think it's because I feel very well taken care of and well, well taken care of in the sense that not only do I see a lot of folks that don't necessarily come out and say like, hey, I'm trans or hey, I'm non-binary or hey, I'm with the community, but there's a lot of queer folks that are within those movements. And on top of that, just feeling 
that I'm taking care of in terms of like mass ready, mass on hand, sanitizer out there, waters, food, everything. It, it's a real sense of community coming together and bringing that sense of safety. Um, something I haven't seen before, but then again, I haven't seen protests and, and, and this kind of national intention in terms of what it means to feel safe. Um, I know Aiden had a little bit of something to add on to that. And I think, Eliana, did you want to respond to that? Go ahead. I just wanted to say thank you. And I'm sorry, Aiden, I, I promise I'll stop after this, that um, because of my privilege, I don't know what other people's experiences are like. But I, I also wonder the extent to which, and Sunnyvale Police Department might already be doing this. Um, but I would wonder if we have any data about the communities who call in for emergency help, um, do we know how, what proportion of LGBTQ people are calling in to ask for help with domestic violence calls or any other kinds of emergencies? Do we know the extent to which people of color are calling in vis-a-vis -vis the total population in the city of Sunnyvale? These might be some really helpful pieces of data to help us to understand the extent to which um, people of color and LGBTQ people of color feel safe accessing emergency services. Thanks for sharing. Go ahead, Adrian. Yeah, um, so Sarah, you're right that the topic of public safety is timely because of recent events, um, but it's also something that was brought up a lot by attendees at last year's listening session. And I think an important thing to note here is that regardless of how LGBTQ friendly Sunnyvale's um, Department of Public Safety is, some communities have an inherited generational mistrust of law enforcement. Um, and while the LGBTQ community, especially LGBTQ people of color, um, it, it's not generational in the same way, but there's also that passed down mistrust um, from things like Stonewall, which is a, a reaction to police raids on gay and transgender bars. Um, or only a few years ago, there was a series of, of murders of queer men in Toronto that prompted questions about whether there was police neglect because of homophobia. Um, and I bring it up only to illustrate that regardless of anything that Sunnyvale DPS has or hasn't done, there's going to be that inherited mistrust. Um, and it isn't fair, but when it comes to trusting people in positions of power, marginalized people sometimes have to think, do I wanna be fair or do I wanna be cautious? Um, so I think it's that wariness that we were seeing last September. And I don't know if there is a way to gain that trust completely, but if there is, I think it would be to actively demonstrate that this is a department that has educated itself about issues affecting the LGBTQ community generally and specifically with relation to police and EMS. Um, and, you know, Chief No being present at this listening session is a good start. Awesome. Thank you for weighing in. And I just want to say, um, and you bring up Stonewall, I just want to acknowledge here right now, I want to say a big happy birthday to Marsha P. Johnson, who's birthday is today if you folks don't know who yes we know who she is <laughs> but if you don't know Marsha P. Johnson Sylvia Rivera two of the 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 starters for this um, LGBTQ liberation movement um, who just recently got their roses uh, in, in New York in, in terms of a statue. So getting that acknowledgement and celebrating and uplifting um, those leaders is very important. So thank you for bringing that up, Aiden. Um, and in terms of some of the challenges or gaps you folks are sitting, seeing within the city of Sunnyvale, um, are there any challenges or gaps in creating greater public safety and community for LGBTQ folks? And if so, what are those, some of those challenges and gaps? I see Mel, you have your uh, mic off, so let's get started with you. Yeah, so I know, Hiliana, you mentioned this, and I don't want to take your idea away, so I'll just briefly mention this. Uh, since classes are virtual now, our teachers get a look into our personal homes, and for a lot of um, for queer young folk, our rooms are sort of like our sanctuary. Uh, for me personally, I know I usually have like a pride flag here, but for certain classes, I have chosen to take them down, unfortunately. And so um, that problem of like confidentiality and wanting to keep your life private is definitely present, but also for students who may not have their own rooms and who are needing to um, 
like do their classes out in the living room and them not wanting other students to know that they have queer parents and things like that. So that's definitely an issue. However, I know within my school, my teachers do a pretty good job of asking us about whether or not we're comfortable with um, doing videos um, on Zoom. But for other schools, I know it's, it's like a hard requirement for them, which is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Quick question for you, Mel. Do they allow you to use like Zoom backgrounds to cover up your room, that sort of thing? Um, yeah, but it varies from computer to computer. So for students, I know for students who um, are renting Chromebooks from our school, they aren't uh, the best quality in regards to that feature. And so you're unable to do that green screen feature. Yeah, well, I just saw someone witness that just today <laughs> within this call. So definitely an accessibility issue, right? To be able to get, have accessibility to technology to be able to learn and those hard requirements. Um, I know, Richard, your, your mic is off. Did you want um, yeah. or on? Yeah, so to me, one of the key challenges here is the lack of a dedicated LGBTQ space in the city of Sunnyvale. And we had, you know, we sort of listed off all these great resources 20 minutes ago, but the pattern was, if it was in Sunnyvale, it was sort of a periodic or occasional pop-up space, right? And if it, was, if it was a regular space, it wasn't in Sunnyvale. You have to schlep down to San Jose or up to San Francisco, basically. So. The example I always give is there is not a single gay bar between San Jose and San Francisco. Um, I think there was one five, but closed five, 10 years ago, right? Um, I actually had a friend, a couple of friends who tried to get one started. And after like two years of trying, they gave up and moved to Palm Springs because they could not find a landlord who would work with them. Uh, on it. Um, so the lack of dedicated spaces is a real challenge when it comes to building community. And I don't want to be privileged bars because there are serious problems in the gay community with privileging bars, but coffee shops, bookshops, uh, art gallery, whatever, you know, um, the lack of a space where you can just go there and be with people like you is a real real problem. Yes. And I think it's probably, it's one of the biggest problems for building LGBTQ community in Sunnyvale. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Go ahead, Heliana. Uh, actually, I think Aiden raised uh, their hand oh. first. So Aiden, I'll let you go first. Excuse me. Sorry, thanks. You. Oh, thank you. Um, just briefly to respond to what Richard was saying. Um, I think you know, you're talking a lot about, about private businesses and it's easy to think like, how is that city government's problem? But that does also intersect with the housing issue because um, LGBTQ people are disproportionately affected by that, as we said earlier. And if it's too expensive to live in or near Sunnyvale, then people aren't going to be, LGBTQ people aren't going to be moving into Sunnyvale to start LGBTQ spaces here. Um, so then it, it sort of falls onto city government to be like, are we going to build this space or are we going to find a way to invite people in to make the space themselves? And I just want to riff off that real quick before I yield to Eliana. There's one other dynamic to that, which is there's a reason why LGBTQ people congregate in cities. And that is because population density makes it easier to find more people like you when you're in a minority. Um, and so you need a certain population density if you're going to be able to support things, a certain degree of walkability, of accessibility, and so forth, if you're going to be able to support these businesses. So that also kind of comes back to this issue of housing. And I'm sorry for bogarting you, Eliana. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, it's so exciting to be on a panel with people who are kind of riffing off each other so much. I appreciate that. Um, two pieces very briefly. One, going back to how exciting it is that we have this flag um, policy now. I, for folks who are not part of the LGBTQ community, you may not know this, but um, you might've heard about gaydar. 
And Gaydar, like, do we have superpowers? I like to think so. But I think actually what it is, is that when we walk into a space, we are very quickly assessing who might around us might be a friend or a foe. It's one of our survival strategies. And so having a rainbow flag anywhere, even if it's minute in a space, we typically will find it very quickly. And we will read it as saying, just as Sarah was mentioning with the trans pride flag, there's some level of awareness here and welcoming, somebody has intentionally welcomed me into this space. So I would say that whether it's the police department or the fire department or bookstores or coffee shops, if they can find a place to put up the trans pride flag and the LGBTQ rainbow pride flag, it really can make a difference to us. And I think that is also a connecting piece of where the city might be able to help us. Um, perhaps we're not at a point yet where we could open up an entire coffee shop that's LGBTQ identified or um, an entire soccer league or, or something like that. But perhaps the city could work with our small local businesses to say, hey, you know, one idea would be to have an LGBTQ night. Um, maybe, you know, to invite the LGBTQ community to do a spoken word night, an open mic night. We have a lot of strength and resilience and creativity and amazing pizzazz in our community that actually can really contribute to the livelihood of our, our businesses and can really add to the culture of the community as well. So that might be one way that we can all kind of work together. Um, the other piece I just want to acknowledge for the folks who are part of this environment or this audience who don't identify as being part of the LGBT community, but they want to know how they can be there to support us. Again, putting a pride flag out there or acknowledging whenever you have an opportunity, maybe you're a teacher in a school or maybe you uh, work in the post department, post office or somewhere to let people know around you that you are open and affirming to LGBTQ people, whether it's visually or verbally, it makes a huge difference for us in our community experience. Yeah, go ahead, Mel. Yeah, I just wanted to add on to that great point. It's honestly not enough for businesses to be like on the down low accepting, like you should be obvious that you're willing to bring these people in and to sort of guarantee that they're gonna be safe within that space. And going off of um, teachers, personally, when I was at school, when I was physically in the classroom and whatnot, I was way more likely to participate in class or to talk amongst my classmates when I saw like a rainbow sticker or a rainbow flag posted somewhere. and the first thing I do when I go into a classroom that's foreign to me is just, I scan the room, I scan mm -hmm. the teacher's desk just to get any sort of glimpse of whether or not I can speak to this person honestly. And that might not be a huge issue for those who aren't within the community, but especially for young people, it is, it's huge for us. Yeah, great point. And um, yeah, go ahead, Aiden. Yeah. Um, I, I do wanted to agree with both Eliana and Mel. I previously worked in a bookstore that in the time I was there transformed into a queer community space. And part of how that happened was we did have a pride flag outside of the door. And that was what was bringing the queer, queer people in so that it was able to become that space. Um, but Mel, I really liked what you said about uh, being prepared to guarantee the safety of LGBTQ people in that space, because I am sort of wary about people um, putting up the flag to pay lip service to allyship without actually doing the work. So it needs to be a combination. Great point. And what I love, and I think Aiden, you're talking about how Sunnyvale has grown from not having pronouns to having pronouns in like signatures now. That for me, especially in a virtual environment, be it Zoom or be it like even email, pronouns in the signature is the same exact thing as putting like a pride flag. And especially in this virtual environment, it, it, it just invites that conversation. And I love seeing those uh, pronouns where they not only include the pronouns, but there's also like links to include 
where they can find more information about pronouns. So just so in case someone just like learning about pronouns is just like, this is new to me. Um, I want to learn about pronouns. They click on that link and it takes them to HRC or it takes them out and equal. And they learn about pronouns on their own. It's education is elevation. I love that saying from one of the one of the great activists I follow. So uh, thank you all for sharing. Uh, how about for LGBTQ allies? I know we have a lot of allies on this call. What is the best recommendation in empowering the city of Sunnyvale public officials, service providers, uh, schools, and general community members to become intentional allies? Any thoughts on allyship? Go ahead, Mel. Yeah, so definitely making progress as a community is big. However, when it comes down to it, it's up to the individual. And so what I like to teach those who are in my club is to normalize the conversation. Don't be afraid to say your pronouns, to, to mention that, hey, that's not my dead name, or that's my dead name, can you not use that? Because the more that we talk about it and the more that we converse about it, the more normal it becomes. And especially for queer folk, it's, we stand out enough <laughs> and standing out within that conversation is even worse because people feel like they need to treat you in a specific way when in actuality, you just wanna be a part of that conversation. And another part about being a good ally is evaluating your own bias, even yeah. amongst people within the LGBTQ community. And also, especially who's someone, especially as someone who's prevalent in like social media and whatnot, gatekeeping is such a big thing. And that in itself, feeling invalid sucks in itself. And so if you're being disregarded by the people who you want to be accepted by the most is super unfortunate. And you should also just evaluate your initial thoughts before you share anything that you want to say to other people. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And Aiden, I think you also brought up something in a discussion we had before this call around um, intentional allyship. Any thoughts on intentional allyship that you want to surface? Yeah, so this is um, less for, in, well, I guess it's for, for both organizations and individuals training. So it's not a fix all, but um, as I mentioned earlier, the library had a training that was attended um, not by all of our customer facing staff. I wish that were the case, but timing, um, but at least by all of our managers and librarians. And as I said earlier, there was a, uh, there were policy changes and uh, customer service changes that resulted from it. So I think um, if you are a member of an organization who has any kind of say in what kind of trainings you do, then some kind of training about the basics of, of issues affecting the LGBTQ community can be immensely helpful and improve your customer service. And even if you're an individual, there are, um, there are sort of less, uh, structured, less official trainings that are available online on YouTube. Um, there's a great book called uh, A Quick and Easy Guide to They Them Pronouns. There's um, A Quick and Easy Guide to Transgender Identities. Um, so just. Thanks for sharing, Aiden. And you're breaking up just a little bit, but there's also a lot of resources from the Office of LGBTQ Affairs. So just make sure you holla people because we are here to support y'all. Um, I have a couple of questions left. Yeah, I know we have around four minutes left. Um, but I want to talk about all the good that's going on. We've discussed some of the challenges and barriers of the LGBTQ uh, community here, uh, you know, like all the, all the issues folks face, but it's also important to lift up the community's positive contributions, what are some of the talents and forms of resiliency you folks are seeing from the LGBT community that can help guide the city of Sunnyvale? Go ahead, Heliana. Thank you. Uh, I think one of the biggest things that the city of Sunnyvale could possibly do for our community would be to hire somebody who specifically works on LGBTQ issues for the city who could look at all of the agencies that we have, whether it be our senior center or um, our library or um, our local health care centers to see the extent to which they are open and affirming of LGBTQ people. Um, I just wanna give a quick shout out to Aiden. Aiden has been with the city of Sunnyvale for a year and a half. 
Aiden has made such a huge difference in our experiences going to this to the library. Not only have there been a plethora of activities that Aiden shared earlier, but frankly, and I, I get a little teary honestly thinking about this, growing up as a queer person here um, in the late 80s and early 90s, there was nothing like what is currently available in the city of Sunnyvale. And had it been available when I was a young person, my experience as a young person might have been dramatically different. I just want to put out there that because of the pandemic and people having to shelter in place, for the one third of LGBTQ youth who are living in homes where they have family members that are rejecting of them, being at home with rejecting family members can increase the rate of suicide by eight times. Conversely, for LGBTQ young people, having just one person who's open and affirming to them can reduce the rate of suicide by 30%. Yeah. So every single time, no matter who we are, if we work at in a grocery store at the counter, or if we, again, are working for the post office or whoever we are in society, if we see somebody who might be part of the LGBTQ community and we are sending a message of openness and inclusivity, or we do what Aiden is suggesting and we go out and we educate ourselves about how we can be allies, we can really make a difference in people's lives. And so to your question, Sarah, about what we can give to community, LGBTQ people are people who have survived pandemics before. We survived the HIV epidemic. We've got a lot to share with everyone right now about how to get through this. We have yeah. survived histories of systemic violence. And so again, we have a lot to give. So I'll just stop right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, a wonderful way to lead us into the next question. So lightning round, folks, because I know we're at time, but in two sentences or less, what do you feel are the most important things the city of Sunnyvale can do better serving, better in serving uh, and supporting the LGBTQ community? So what could the city of Sunnyvale do better? Give us your thoughts and your suggestions. I'll start prioritize a permanent dedicated LGBTQ space in the city of Sunnyvale. Uh, that is the number one biggest thing right now. Beautiful. Go ahead, Mal. Let queer young folk know that they're noticed and that we're forever constantly striving for a more inclusive city. Absolutely. Aiden or Eliana? Ooh, Eliana? Uh, I would say um, hiring somebody who specifically is gonna look at LGBTQ issues across the city. And then if we can't do that, that we at least will start to look at our senior center and our library and other places to see the extent to which our resources are open and affirming and reflecting the positivity of our community as well. Wonderful. And Aiden, you gotta take us home. What is your recommendation? Ooh. I'm just going to repeat what I said earlier about um, making sure that our city departments and our local organizations um, that provide service to people are trained on LGBTQ issues. Wonderful, wonderful. Folks, we are at time and I just want to say thank you to all the guests. I want all my guests to get off their mics and just like round of applause for Ileana, Mel, Aiden, and Richard, you folks were amazing. Thank you so much for being part of this panel and giving those recommendations. These, This is so amazing, folks, to be able to give recommendations straight from the heart of LGBTQ folks within the city of Sunnyvale. So thank you so much for being part of this panel. Um, what we're gonna do next is we're gonna take a quick four minute break um, and then we're gonna go into breakout. So hold on tight, grab a water, use the bathroom, I wouldn't say get air because it's probably not a good idea right now, but maybe stand up and stretch, right? Do what you can. And we're going to take a, a quick four minute break and we're going to come back with uh, our next portion of today's event that includes a lot of surveys and a lot of polling and it includes you folks that are on. So thank you for the time today and we're going to take a quick break. Thank you.
quick shout out to Aiden. We can really quick shout out to Aiden. We can really quick shout out. Quick shout. We can really quick shout out. Okay, it is 6.35 p.m. and we are going to resume the session. Welcome back. My name is Jackie Guzman and I'm the Deputy City Manager for the City of Sunnyvale and serve as the City's Diversity and Inclusion Liaison. I'll be facilitating the community input portion of our listening session. Um, and we're going to kick things off with a few polling questions and then move to public comment using some prompted questions. So I do want to remind you, if you're on YouTube and want to participate on um, the poll or speak later on, look for the Zoom link in the description and click on that. Um, and that will lead you into the Zoom meeting and you'll be able to participate in the polling or speak. All right, so before we begin our polling, um, I do want to go over some agreements. So as your facilitator uh, or your facilitators, we will correct misinformation and bias statements, make sure that we stay on track and on time. Um, Sarah did a wonderful job with our panel, thank you. Um, and creates a safe space to have a productive conversation. For participants, uh, we ask, that you share this time with other community members, allow others to speak their truth, be mindful of how long um, you take up in airspace, um, speak from your own experience, don't assume for others and respectfully disagree if necessary um, and also say why. With that, we will get started. Um, if you are on Zoom, the poll should pop up on your screen. And let's get those polling questions started. So to start, um, how safe do you feel as an LGBTQ person in Sunnyvale? And we'll just give a few moments for folks to answer the question.
And don't be shy, it's all neutral here. We can't um, see how you're answering. You're, it's completely um, anonymous. And panelists, you guys are our guests too and part of our community, so feel free to participate as well. Yeah, it does not, oh, it looks like it's allowing us to vote now. All right. All right, so we will go ahead and end the polling question. It seems like um, it's either neutral or safe. And so we'll go to our next polling question. All right, so the next question is, how welcome do you feel as an LGBTQ person in Sunnyvale? I still see some coming in. All right, and we'll end the, the poll. And it looks like people are sort of neutral for the most part. Okay, our third polling question. How much opportunity do you have to connect with other LGBTQ people in Sunnyvale? I know this came up in our panel discussion, so it'll be interesting to see how folks on the call feel. And yeah, not, not a surprise based on what the panelists said that there's not um, very many opportunities. Let's go to the next polling question. And how much opportunity, or sorry, let's see. Um, how would you rate your satisfaction with the service and programs of the city of Sunnyvale? Okay, so um, there's some neutrality here and, and I'm glad to see no one's dissatisfied. Um, so we'll move on to, I think our last question. Which is an open-ended question. And for that, we are going to, um, have a, uh, we're going to use the Q&A feature that is if you're on a computer at the bottom of your screen, if you're on an iPad, it might be at the top. But the question is, what do you have, do you have any questions for our Chief of Public Safety, for a city manager, mayor, or city council? So we'll, you can open up the Q&A and um, put in any questions there. And we unfortunately don't have uh, time to answer those live on um, the screen. However, um, we can answer those in the chat itself. And we'll also be collecting these, these questions um, and include your, your questions and the answers on our website at sunnyvale.ca.gov. So if there are any questions that do come in, we will make sure to um, answer those later on. So now um, we are gonna move on to public comment. So we have four questions that we would like to ask you. Um, and again, um, you can participate if you are on Zoom. And if you are on Zoom, you can use the raise hand button to let us know that you would like to speak. 
Again, panelists, you're welcome to, to jump in as well. You are our community members and we'd love to hear more from you. Um, and if you are calling on the phone, you can press star nine if you would like to speak. Just remember that if you are on the phone and watching YouTube live stream, just remember to mute um, the YouTube video um, while you provide your comments to avoid echoing. I'll call the name of the next speaker um, and the two following speakers, uh, and you'll have about a minute to respond. So the first question we have is, what are your top concerns about living um, and or working in Sunnyvale as an LGBTQ person? And again, you can just use the raise your hand feature. If you would like to ask a question. And I'm not seeing anybody raise their hand. Perhaps I could chime in with something. And sure. um, I think that this might get at something that I think is kind of an interesting angle. And I know, Jackie, that you and I have talked about this a little bit. Um, but Sunnyvale is sort of one of the iconic examples of suburbia in America. Right. It's one of the like um, the city was built on the defense and the aerospace industry in the 50s. The Eichler tracks are considered classics, like historic classics of subur suburban development and also historic for not for explicitly rejecting racial covenants. Um, but there is a very interesting sort of angle to suburbia, which is suburbia has often been considered this sort of engine of conformity uh, that it, suburbia itself, the built form of it, the cultural norms of it, enforce conform conformity. And there's this line from William Levitt, as in Levittown, no man who owns his own house and lot can be a communist. He has too much to do. No man who owns his own home and lot, right? And I think that gets at something. And I kind of wonder the extent to which, you know, I think LG, Sunnyvale, LGBT folks are welcome in Sunnyvale to the extent they don't color too far out the, outside the lines, if that makes sense. And I wanted to sort of maybe pose that question is like, even within with this concept of LGBT acceptance, is there also a conformity here? Thank you. If anybody else would like to raise their hand um, or speak, then you can use the raise your hand feature. If not, we'll move on, on to the next question, which is, do you experience any barriers as an LGBTQ person accessing city or county services? And if so, what are those barriers? And again, please uh, use the raise your hand feature or press star nine. And panelists also feel free to chime in. Jackie, I have something to share. Sure, go ahead. Uh, when I was a new mom in the city of Sunnyvale, I accessed these wonderful classes for new parents um, that were like singing and music classes that you could go to with the, your small child. And um, I brought my dad with me. And I remember when I thought about bringing my dad's husband as well, I just wasn't sure the extent to which our gay family and our intergenerational gay family would be welcome um, in this space that was specifically set up for young families. And so it, it's not that it was necessarily a barrier, but I felt like we had to kind of present as a heterosexual family in order to be accepted there. And again, it wasn't because anyone told me that we wouldn't be accepted, but because there was no indication that we would be accepted, I felt like we had to be closeted. 
And in the same way, uh, now that my son is going to school in a Sunnyvale school, I'm not sure the extent to which even my participation on this panel might have negative repercussions for him um, should somebody in the school connect me to my son. Thank you, Eliana. Um, I see that Mel has her hand up. Mel, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah. I would like to add that I would want to see these services be more obvious um, in regards to schools and letting, letting the youth know that these services do exist, especially um, in regards to reaching out to GSA clubs specifically. There's been a number of uh, outside businesses that have, that have reached out to me, like the Sunnyvale Public Library. However, not not so much with uh, the city of Sunnyvale. I'm going to chime in briefly as well. Um, this is not just with LGBT issues, but I think the city needs to be doing a better job at getting information out to residents, uh, in particular via social media. Um, you know, that's this is this is a major. Uh, this is it. It's a challenge since we don't have really have a local newspaper anymore, right? And it's a challenge that a lot of local governments are facing. But I think we need to be doing more on social media to let our residents know that these services ex services exist, and also to let our residents know about public meetings and other matters of concern that are coming up. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more hands raised, so we'll go to the next question, which is, what other topics would you like to see addressed? Is there something that we missed in terms of um, the panelist questions or the questions that we're asking now? And again, use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you're on the phone. Mel, go ahead. Uh, so I would like to bring up the topic of LGBTQ education within schools, specifically within the topic of sex ed. I know that I received, I guess, the, the standard type of um, presentation. And so I'd, I'd like to see a change in that. And I know that the school district and the city of Sunnyvale are two different things. However, I would like to see more um, just cohesiveness within how open and accepting Sunnyvale is and, and then within how open and accepting schools could be. Thank you. Um, I don't see anybody else's hand raised, so we'll go ahead and um, ask our last que question, which is what action steps would you like to see from the city of Sunnyvale and the community on these topics? And again, um, you can use the raise your hand feature or press star nine if you're on the phone. I have something to add to that in terms of- Yeah, go steps. ahead, Sarah. Um, I think in terms of action steps, empowering LGBTQ folks to uh, be part of the decision-making process is crucial. Uh, and there's there's four wonderful uh, folks, five if we can include Jackie, <laughs> that, that could really make an impact in, in advising as to uh, what Sunnyvale can do to be more inclusive and accepting of not just LGBTQ people, but uh, folks around all intersecting identities. And the cool thing about it is that not only do you have this knowledge base of wonderful people that could actually impact community, but Sunnyvale to me, and I know San Jose always says like, oh, we're the tech capital of the world. It's just like, 
Well, that email is actually, that's where Microsoft is. That's where LinkedIn is. That's where a lot of places are. So there's a lot of ways where you could actually leverage private business to be involved. Maybe not in like policy change, but maybe finding some way to streamline that kind of mentorship or find some ways where uh, I know like employee resource groups uh, are big within like, you know, Fortune 500 companies and being uh, finding ways to bring out those community members to make a home for for folks of that uh, of that community and just seeing what best practices they have to be able to uh, bring a little bit more equity, uh, a little bit more community within Sunnyvale. So see, seeing how you could serve the community, not only from, um, you know, marginalized end, but all over, because I know the community that is within Sunnyvale in terms of uh, like big tech, and it, I, I don't want to sweep it under the rug that I know Sunnyvale has a lot of tech companies within it. So leveraging what resources you have to see what best practices could be put in place to make uh, a greater community with the LGBT community. So that's some things that are some considerations I'm thinking. Thank you. Um, we also have Camille. Camille, go ahead and unmute yourself. Oops. Hi, thank you for allowing me to speak. I just wanted to mention um, when answering these questions um, on these polls, I didn't feel like a lot of the questions applied to me because I, I don't necessarily feel like I'm out in Sunnyvale. Um, I uh, am, am new to living here and um, I'm not aware of a lot of the LGBTQ events that happen. So as far as action steps from the city, I'd love to see more LGBTQ community events um, geared towards our community so that I can connect with people that look like me or, or have similar experiences to me. Um, I feel like, you know, when I am going about my daily life in the city of Sunnyvale, um, I'm not out and people don't perceive me as queer. So as far as um, feeling safe, you know, I might feel safe, but it's because I'm in the closet, technically. So, um, so I'd love to be able to see more people like me in the community and connect with them. Thank you. Thank you. So I kind of want to riff off of both of those for some suggestions. Um, I think a, an LGBTQ affairs commission or a cultural diversity commission or something along those lines as a city commission could be a way to sort of formalize, uh, a way to sort of bring different stakeholders and ideas to the table and so forth. Now. Um, because of the Brown Act, because of the way commissions are structured, you may not want to structure it as a formal commission. You might want to structure it as some sort of periodic roundtable, um, but that would be an option. The other thing I would say, I really want to thank Camille for her comments and uh, say how important that is. I think that you know one thing that we should be looking at possibly for next year would be perhaps an LGBT festival, a pride festival in conjunction maybe with Silicon Valley Pride in conjunction with the Downtown Business Association. You know, let's let's paint Murphy Avenue in rainbows, you know. Um, so those that, those are a couple ideas I would have. And the other the only other one I'd say is let's have more drag queen story time. We got you covered, Mayor, if you need it. <laughs> we have all those resources. <laughs> Thank you. Um, anybody else want to speak? Please just raise your hand or panelists and mute yourselves and, and go ahead. I'm beaming ear to ear. I cannot say how amazing it would be if we had a pride festival on Murphy Street. 
uh, that just, I just, I, I don't know if you can hear me smiling. It's so incredible to think of what that could be like for our city. I completely agree. And I also love the idea of having some kind of a diversity group um, or and or an LGBT group that's formalized that that could provide feedback to the city. Um, excellent ideas. Thank you. Um, I will share that the city is actually um, has a study issue on um, diversity inclusion. It, it's a cultural inclusion study. So we are looking at a you know comprehensive look at our departments and studying how we can do a better job at making sure that we are being inclusive. And so um, I'm excited about that work as a city's diversity and inclusion liaison. And um, I hope that um, we can come up with some really good recommendations to make sure that we are being more um, inclusive and welcoming to all of you. Since we have a little bit of extra time, I don't know if um, you know the Jackie. chief or our city manager would like to make a comment. Jackie, um, before that, um, Aiden had their hand up. Oh, I did oh. not see that. Aiden, go yes. ahead. Um, I just want to um, echo what Camille said. Thank you for your comment, Camille. And um, say that when I moved to this area and started working in Sunnyvale, there was sort of a, a phenomenon of recloseting where when I was in Seattle, I was completely out. And then once I moved back here, I didn't mean to go back in the closet, but there's just sort of such a lack of LGBTQ spaces and awareness that it sort of happened by itself. Um, where, you know, in Seattle, it was not assumed that you're, you're straight and cisgender until otherwise stated, whereas here it kind of is. And you have to like, uh, I, think, I think Richard talked about this before, you sort of have to loudly be out in order to, in order to be seen. Um, and I also want to echo what Eliana said earlier about being not sure if her gay fathers would be welcome at... Um, at, at an event, uh, I think that that very much is the feeling where um, I'm marked neutral on a lot of the safety questions because it isn't that there's there's anything to let me know that I am not safe or not welcome, but without the positive indication that I am safe and welcome, it's I really have to uh, kind of assume that I'm not in order to keep myself safe. Um, and then I just, one last thing to add, this doesn't have to do with action steps so much as just something that we didn't mention is gender neutral restrooms. That's, that didn't come up, but it's so important. Um, I know that we require businesses if they have a, a single occupant um, restroom to market gender neutral, but a lot of our buildings, a lot of our city buildings still don't have gender neutral restrooms. Thank you, Aiden. And um, our city manager would like to make a comment, Kent. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. I just wanted to take a minute and thank all the panelists for participating and especially Sarah, you did a fantastic job. You bring so much positive energy to this. Um, I just appreciate all the, the positive vibe you brought to our session this evening. So thanks so much. Thank you. And Chief, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanna thank uh, everybody uh, who's attended this meeting too. Um, you know, I've been in uh, law enforcement for a little bit over 30 years, but it seems like uh, I'm learning new things every day. And a couple of takeaways that I got from this meeting is that I think, I think first and foremost, uh, there were some comments about uh, the reluctance or the fear of the LGBTQ community members of uh, calling 911 and domestic violence uh, situations. And I think it's sad uh, if that is occurring. And I know that we have a county protocol uh, by law enforcement agencies here in the county uh, and the district attorney's office. And uh, we don't ask questions about sexual orientation or that's not even an issue for us. Domestic violence is domestic violence. And I'm pretty confident that our policy mirrors the countywide protocol. But my the, the takeaway from this conversation is that uh, we in law enforcement, we have to do a better job of sharing that information to people. And we have to do it continu uh, continually to make sure that people are comfortable in calling us because uh, we need to, to respond to those calls. 
And then the second thing is that, you know, Aiden's comment about, you know, there's still that mistrust between law enforcement and the LGBTQ community. And, and I get it, you know, what happened in Stonewall happened in the late sixties, but uh, that's not too long ago. And I think uh, just me growing up in, in San Francisco as, as a young kid where I was exposed to um, the assassination of Harvey Milk, who was a mayor at the time and the person who killed him uh, was Dan White, and he was a former police officer. And so I know that was a seminal moment also for the LGBTQ community. And while it seems like it's decades ago, but for a lot of people, it's still fresh. And so I recognize the fact that we still have a lot of work ahead of us, uh, although I am confident that we have evolved quite a bit in law enforcement in terms of understanding, accepting, uh, and working with the LGBTQ communities across the country, but there's still a lot of work to be done. So I really appreciate the fact uh, that um, all of you are willing to have this discussion with us today. So thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, I just like to share a little bit about, um, you know, what happens next. So um, the city is hosting two more sessions. This is part of our Sunnyvale Unity Sessions. Um, as the mayor mentioned, uh, our next two sessions, the, the next one is a Spanish language listening session on Thursday, September 10th from 5.30 to 7.30. And we will also have a public safety roundtable discussion. That'll happen at the end of September. We don't have a date yet, but um, if you'd like to learn more, um, you can um, go to our website, sunnyvale.ca.gov slash unity. Um, staff is documenting your feedback and questions. Um, the city's leadership team will be reviewing and discussing the community feedback from this and every one of the uh, five community listening sessions, um, as well as other public comment that has come in um, via email, um, at our council meetings, um, during public comment, or through um, our portal access Sunnyvale. Um, and we are going to be looking internally to figure out how we can better serve you. Um, that's our goal. And, you know, just wanted to let you know that your feedback will inform our decisions on um, programming and policies moving forward. Um, so we really appreciate the time that you've taken to share with us. We do plan to update the community and our city, city council on our progress at a study session on October 13th. So um, mark your calendars for that if you would like to know um, how we're moving forward. And if you have any questions or concerns, you feel free to email um, us at unity at sunnyvale.ca.gov. Again, that's unity at sunnyvale.ca.gov. And with that, I will hand it over to our mayor to close us out. Thank you very much, Jackie. And thanks to everyone who joined tonight's listening session. It's been a great discussion, lots of good ideas. I love the idea about a pride festival on Murphy Avenue. Let's make that happen after COVID, of course. Um, thank, thank you to Sarah Fernando for, for moderating the panel discussion and to the panelists. So Aiden, uh, Heliana, Mel, Richard, uh, for your insightful comments. You know, I especially wanna express my gratitude to those of you who, who shared your stories, your concerns, and your vision for a better Sunnyvale. You know, I also want to acknowledge Daniel uh, Moretti uh, from the Office of LGBTQ Affairs, who was instrumental in putting together tonight's agenda. Thanks to City Clerk uh, David Kernahan and Deputy City Manager Jackie Guzman, who managed the behind the scenes uh, logistics of, of having this event take place. So thank you very much. It went very smooth today. Uh, thank you for everyone for your hard work. You know, we're committed from a Sunnyvale standpoint to be uh, transparent and we'll be re we will be responding to those questions and sharing additional information to continue this dialogue around policy discussions. You know, as Jackie said, we invite you to visit sunnyvale.ca.gov slash unity to subscribe to our email list, to stay inform informed of our progress. Thank you very much for being here. Stay safe. 
wear your mask, and of course, have a good evening. Thanks for being here. Good night.